have a great God? And we declare today, holy, 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 God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we truly have an awesome God. There is no God like Jehovah. I'm going to ask Bob Jordan to come right now and lead us in prayer this morning. Good morning. Will you join with me? Father God, you're just awesome. Lord, we feel your presence, Lord, each and every day, and we just praise you for that. We praise you for loving us the way that you do, Lord. We pray so thankful that you put us in your heart, Lord, and we just honor you today, Lord. Today we learned a little bit in uh, Sunday school the importance of experiencing you, Lord, and I just pray that that will continue to grow within our hearts, that we have that experience and that relationship that we so need in our lives, Lord. I pray over today's service, Lord, I pray you speak to us. I pray that Pastor Dave delivers the message, but more importantly, Lord, that we take the message into our lives and we apply it to our lives as well. I pray all of these things in your precious name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. Hosea 6, 3. Good morning. I just want to take a moment and ask uh, before we stand uh, to center ourselves. Um, to prepare ourselves for worship this morning. I think sometimes worship can become, even for myself, uh, systematic, right? You come to church, you listen to the um, announcements, you do the offering, obviously you have the message and, and worship as well. And sometimes, um, even myself, I know when I'm leading or when I'm out there, I, you're so involved in the music. And then there's other days like you're thinking like, well, as soon as church is over, I have this to do, and then there's this to do tomorrow, and then the rest of the week is ahead of me, and I've got this to do. If we're all being honest with ourselves, our mind can easily wander there. But God wants us right here this morning to be present. He wants us to set aside all the worries of this morning, what's left to do today, tomorrow. We don't even know if tomorrow's going to be here to begin with. So why are we so worried about it? So if you would this morning stand with me, and let's prepare our hearts to worship our Lord and Savior, the honor that he deserves.
that's awesome hearing that. The feedback is just cool. It's really cool. wants us. We haven't done this song in a while. Uh, it's been a long while. The first time I heard this song, um, I had uh, just met my husband. We weren't married then, obviously. Um, and I heard this song at a, an, an evening um, worship. It was just in a building, and you were just there to worship. And I can't think of a better way to end worship this morning.
ourselves in him and we say, I stand for you, Lord. I want to worship you this morning. I want you to be here, Lord. I thank you for your grace. I feel your Holy Spirit this morning. Let's do that individually this morning together. before you individually, Father, saying, we praise you, we honor you, we worship you this morning. Just as Ann spoke about actions, it's our actions that people see, Father. Help us, Lord, as we go throughout the rest of this day to remember that you are with us always. Father, help us to remember this week that you are with us always through those those trying times that we talk about, Lord, and the ups and downs and the, the ebbs and flows, Father, you are there. We thank you again for this morning. Oh, Father, do we thank you. You are our Savior. You are the all-knowing. And you deserve the praise, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Kim's going to be singing, and let's listen to see what the Lord has for us today. I stand before you now, the greatness of your renown. I have heard of the majesty and
Well, we have a couple videos to share. Thank you, Kim. And what a, what a precious word. When we are experiencing Christ, we are able to say clearly, we have no fear. When we understand who we are in him, what a blessing it is to have that personal relationship. In Sunday school this morning, we were defining our spiritual journey not by how much we know intellectually, but how much we know from our experience. So important that we get this. I wanna first show you a video from uh, Malawi, and this is just a small clip and uh, not a lot of sound that's important on it, but what is happening is uh, we got the opportunity to have another water well drilled and we are so happy in this village Colombo and we see the water now uh, coming out I have since received a video showing that the uh, pumping unit is in and all the cement is right now being cured around this well and uh, hopefully we'll be able to show you how all of the people in this area are coming uh, for safe drinking water and uh, bringing their animals as well. This is a, a game changer uh, in this area. We're so thankful for this. And then I wanted you to see and hear this next clip, uh, the uh, ministry in Liberia that we are partnering with. Uh, it's been the ministry in Africa that we've been with the longest. Uh, just so thankful for community church ministries. They have planted scores of churches now. Uh, they just licensed nine men uh, for preaching ministry and also had four men ordained, set aside, set apart um, for the ministry as pastors. And uh, do I want you to listen to Ebene or, yeah, Ebenezer Brown is in the background giving them a charge, and this is at the tail end of that charge. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word who will judge the living and the dead all his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season convince and I'm just uh, so impressed. I got very emotional when I saw this because this is uh, a new um, group of men uh, and uh, their wives as well that will be uh, going out into the field. They will be preaching. They will be evangelists. They will be missionaries. Uh, some of them will eventually be pastors of churches that they've planted. Uh, what a joy it is for us to continue to see this uh, ongoing ministry. Uh, this is truly something that we rejoice in. Uh, we need to continue to pray uh, for them. When you look up at our ceiling and see all the flags, it isn't just the countries that we are highlighting, it's the souls that are right there now uh, serving the Lord. They are pressing on, they are pursuing persistently Jesus Christ. And uh, remember to keep praying for them. Just before I came out into the sanctuary today, our live stream was starting. As you know, we have people tuning in from many different countries, and we did have one prayer request that uh, came, I believe, from Kenya, and uh, we wanted to take that prayer request right now before the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this uh, individual that asked us to pray for their pastor. Lord, he is sick. Lord, he is being troubled right now with this illness and i'm praying lord for your healing i pray father for your will to be done we pray for restoration we pray for his people lord i'm asking that you would just bring him out of that bed of affliction and that he would once again be able to proclaim the truth of your word Lord, we have confidence that you are the god that not only hears but you are the god that answers prayer you are our healer jehovah rapha Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In fact, we're going to pick up right where Ebenezer left off. He was using 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 to exhort 
uh, these brothers in the Lord. I want to give you a little background to 2 Timothy. By the time Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, the young pastor had been ministering to the church at Ephesus for some four years. And it had been almost that long since he had received his first letter from Paul. Timothy had been a faithful servant uh, of Christ, and he was a co-laborer with Paul since he left home with the apostle more than a decade earlier. Since that time, Timothy had ministered alongside Paul for the duration of both the second and third missionary journeys. Uh, he went with Paul to places such as Troas, Philippi, and Corinth. Timothy was not unfamiliar to the Ephesians when he settled in Ephesus to minister because he had served there alongside Paul for a period of close to three years on Paul's third missionary journey. Paul wrote again to this young leader in the church at Ephesus to provide him encouragement and fortitude in the face of difficulties and trials. So he wrote this letter from a dark and damp prison cell in Rome just before his death in AD 67. You might recall from history that the Roman emperor Nero had been slowly descending into madness since his ascent to the throne in AD 54. And this process uh, was increased when the great fire of Rome in AD 64 burned half the city. And so with all the residents of Rome in an uproar, Christians became a convenient target for Nero. And he used believers as scapegoats for his city's own lack of preparedness. Paul was one of those individuals that was caught up in this persecution. And after he was imprisoned for a period of time, he was beheaded. This was something that Paul knew was coming. It was imminent. And that was why he wrote this letter to Timothy. And so it's important for us to, to look at this letter and to always understand the context. Uh, this is a letter that really truly shows us the state of Paul's mind. And it also uh, gives us great indication as to what was going on in the early church. Of course, it has a lot to say to us today. And so again, we ask the Holy Spirit to just instruct us and guide us as we spend a few moments in this passage. Let's read some of the verses here. I think I'll, I'll just read to verse 10 for now, uh, beginning with verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed to Thessalonica. Cretans for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Lord, help us to just truly understand what we can 
grasp in this today to uh, put an, into action in our lives. Lord, you have made it very clear that the reading of your word is precious and it's something that we should grab a hold of, but it's also something that we should understand needs to be applied to our life. There needs to be action. Lord, we have to experience our faith, not just intellectually know how to describe faith. Lord, I thank you for the way you spoke through holy men, and you have given us this God-inspired, God-inerrant word. And we thank you for Paul, our brother Paul, who was faithful unto death. Lord, help us now to just relate some thoughts and principles that would help us as we continue in our spiritual journey for as long as you keep us here. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As I've indicated already, we certainly can gain insight as we look at this passage of Scripture. And if someone is telling me that they will not be able to talk with me again or that they think their, their death is imminent, it is going to cause me to listen up to what they're saying even more. I'm, I'm going to lean in to what they're saying. I, I'm going to try to, to understand what they're saying, not just hear. And certainly we need to do that today. I want to give you some, some thoughts that, that I have seen in this passage. I'm going to suggest that you look at these four thoughts and, and apply them uh, to your life. First of all, the first thought is this. Everyone will stand before Jesus. Everyone. There are no exceptions. All of us are going to stand before the Lord as he judges the living and the dead. Now, as believers, we know Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. He bore the wrath of God in our place. And so while we will not stand before him at the great white throne judgment that is detailed in Revelation 20, we still are going to stand before him at what we can call the Bema judgment seat, which is noted in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is where our works will be tested. It is there that believers will receive reward or will lose reward. You see, no one is going to escape Judgment, And that is why Paul tells the church at Corinth, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The second thought is this. Preach the word, even when people refuse to listen. I want to read those verses again. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure inflictions, uh, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Knowing that his death is imminent, Paul exhorts Timothy to do what he has been doing since he came to Christ and followed him. And that is this, proclaim the truth, preach the word. Preach it when you're prepared to preach it. Preach it when you, when you are not prepared to preach it. He's telling Timothy clearly, be bold, don't shrink back, don't get weary. And when he says preach the word, not just part of the word, but preach the whole counsel of God. And people may cover their ears. Do you remember Stephen? He was preaching the word. And he preached uh, a great sermon uh, from the Old Testament. And he got it to the point where he was accentuating what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And the Sanhedrin, all of the intellectuals of, of the faith were there. And as soon as he began proclaiming this truth to them, what does the Bible tell us? They stopped their ears. They put their hands over their ears. And they started becoming loud in their accusations against Stephen. But Stephen continued to preach. 
until his last breath, he was preaching the word. Even to the point that he became like his Savior. Father, do not charge them with this sin. Forgive them. You see, Paul understood for the church to continue, men and women need to stand and witness and speak the word without any apology. Speak the truth of God's word. I remember Jeremiah doing the same thing. If you are familiar with Jeremiah and his ministry, you will understand that he was preaching exactly what God told him to preach, and no one liked it because it was about God's judgment coming down on people who had consistently rejected the word of God and had lived in disobedience. And yet it was a message of love and it was a message of hope in the midst of the message of the pending judgment that was on its way. And I'm so glad that Jeremiah preached the word. He did not back away. There was a time when it became pretty tough because even his own family was against him and they had thrown him into prison and they had threatened him and it, it was a, not a, a happy situation for Jeremiah by any means. And he said, I just can't do this anymore. And yet as he continued to know who he was in God, in the Lord, the word just burned inside of him and he proclaimed what the word was and it was truth. And I'm glad he did because... This is some of the proclamation of Jeremiah who did not back down. He said these things, nothing is too hard for the Lord. He said, call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you cannot imagine. Exactly what God told him to say. And then as he was watching the Babylonian storm just totally settle in over Judah, these are the words that he continued to proclaim. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. This is why Paul is telling Timothy, preach the word. Preach the whole counsel of God because that is what will bring hope. That is what will bring transformational life to this world. The third thought is this. Being faithful to the Lord brings great reward. In verse 6 we read, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We actually see two rewards here. The first one is the reward of crossing the finish line with integrity and with honor. Paul was confident that in spite of missteps and battles with the flesh, in spite of persecution and perplexities by God's grace, he had fought the good fight. He finished the race. He kept the faith. At this point, he had no regrets. He had no guilt. Now remember, at one point, as he was writing to the church at Rome, Paul asked this question, who is going to deliver me from the body of this death? The things I shouldn't do, I do. The things I should do, I don't. But ultimately, he pressed on. He understood the power of confessing sin, of living in and with repentance. He constantly claimed God's promises. He gave himself as a living sacrifice. And it's important for all of us to understand today that we can have that same kind of experience. We too can move toward that kind of reward to cross the finish line. Yes, there's times that we fall and we fail. 
But praise God, he has given us that opportunity to not stay in that position because he has set us free. We can confess sin, we can repent of it, and we can move forward. And if we fall again, we confess that sin. We understand we are battling the flesh and we begin to purpose to press on even more to pursue the word and to pursue Christ just as Paul did, because we want that reward of Jesus greeting us at the finish line. So often we hear people say, oh, I want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And yes, don't we want to hear that? But if we're truly going to hear that, we cannot in any way fail to remember our part in being faithful. He is faithful. We can be confident in that. We too need to be faithful. And when that wavers, we need to acknowledge it and get rid of it immediately. And once again, stand up and press on. We can get that reward. The second reward is, is spelled out here. It is the crown of righteousness. And it's specifically given to those who are living with the anticipation of the coming of Christ. People who are just wanting that, uh, that appearing to, to happen. Now, remember a few months ago we were addressing this. We're not talking about the kind of attitude that says, man, I am so sick of my life here. I'm sick of this, this uh, present generation. I just want Jesus to come and get me out of here. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the kind of relationship that we have that's saying, Lord, I know you're coming. I'm waiting for you to come. Yes, Lord, come quickly. But that is motivating me to live a life of holiness. That is motivating me to live a life of surrender because I know you're coming. I believe you are coming. I want you to come. And so that is the reason why I want to live a life and fight the good battle of faith. I want to finish my course. I want to cross that finish line because we know the appearing of Christ is imminent. And that's how we are to live. The fourth thought is this. Don't be deterred if you find yourself alone. Now, as he ends his letter, it's interesting, he speaks about loneliness. In fact, if you go to the Greek, you will find that it is very expressive, so much more than our English words can describe. He is, he is really expressing an experience of loneliness. There's pain in his words. In fact, one Bible scholar states that he can't read this portion without becoming teary-eyed himself. Let's pick it up at verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. And Tych uh, Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me so much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Paul is absolutely expressing in this moment pain. In fact, there's, there's a little bit of anger when he is speaking about Demas and, and about Alexander, the, the coppersmith. In fact, some suggest that it was Alexander that put the authorities onto Paul, and that is why he was in prison. And as Paul is describing his, his position right now, he is talking about many people that were with him at one point, but they're no longer there. That is why he's telling Timothy, you've got to bring them with you when you come again. But they're not there, not because they didn't want to be with Paul. They're not there because they're working and laboring for the Lord in other places. And as you know, as human beings, we can only be in one place at one time. Paul also mentions 
the fact that here he is in Rome and he loved the Roman church. He loved the Roman believers. I mean, we know that from his letters to other churches even. He wanted to be in Rome. He yearned to be with these believers. And yet when it came for the time for him to stand in front of the court at, on his, his first uh, uh, occasion, he makes it very clear no one was there. No one rallied around me. No one came to my defense, he said. So he is in this lonely period. And we can't help but feel for him. Have you ever felt lonely? Loneliness is, is, is kind of funny because you can be in a crowd of people and feel lonely. Or you can truly be all alone and just have a lot of pain and turmoil. And sometimes when we get lonely, it can lead to depression and with withdrawal. You know, I was reminded as I was thinking of Paul's experience about Elijah's experience. You know, he spent three years in the desert, uh, just where God told him to be. God took care of him, put him by the, the brook that had water. And, and God at times would even bring food to him uh, through the ravens. And there's no record at that time of Elijah be, being lonely at all. And yet after his victory on Mount Carmel and he called, called the, the fire of God down from heaven and, and hundreds of, of prophets of Baal and Asheroth were killed, uh, no longer to trouble Israel. What a great victory he had. He was threatened by Jezebel and he became overwhelmed by that threat and he, he ran and he hid. And all of a sudden we see him in such a lonely state, in fact a depressed state, to where he just wanted the Lord then to end his life. You know the story. And in that lonely setting, he made this declaration, I'm the only one. I'm the only one that's serving you. That's pretty lonely. And yet, Elijah and Paul, in, in this dilemma of loneliness, did the right thing. Both of them came to a point where they acknowledged in, in this realm of loneliness... The Lord was present. The Lord did not leave him. And I love what the scripture says here in verse 17. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You see... All of us are going to go through lonely times. It's going to happen. There are many different circumstances that we go through that can certainly be a catalyst to this loneliness feeling. But we have to remember, it isn't a place that we must continually reside. It may be true that there are not tangible individuals reaching out to us, embracing us, and helping us at different moments of our life. But it is never true that God is not there. God is always present. God is our strength. And this is what Paul is referring to. This is what Elijah understood as he once again picked up the banner and he listened to what the Lord was saying to him in that still, small voice. And both of them were obedient and understood they still had ministry. They had a labor for the Lord to do. Elijah picked up where he left off. And then Elisha came on the scene. And Elisha was mentored by Elijah. And Paul here 
knowing that his days are numbered, he is letting Timothy know, yep, there's pain. I am struggling. I'm expressing this emotion to you. But understand this, when you have it and people aren't there for whatever reason, the Lord is with you, Timothy. And he is going to give you strength. This is the word for us today. And I love the way Paul concludes his letter. After he has expressed his loneliness, look at what he does. It's just truly amazing. Verse 18, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then what does he say? Verse 19, Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus uh, or Asius stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Ubalus greets you as well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. Farewell, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. So what is he saying here? He has just said that people aren't there. Everyone forsook him. But now, when he has gained strength, hey, the Lord was with me, he now recognizes there are a lot of people there. And he's telling Timothy about them. And he's actually encouraging Timothy through these people. See, that's what happens when we get ourselves beyond ourself in that lonely period and put our focus on the Lord because we recognize the truth of the matter is is that we are never ever alone and that there are people around us there are people who have supported us there are people who have embraced us in the past they certainly are going to embrace us in the future because we are in this together we have been called by God to be family that is why it's so important that we understand we should never ever allow anyone out Outside to ever shut us down again because we cannot forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This is our fellowship. This is where we belong. This is how we gain strength. This is how we keep from becoming so lonely. You and I must always reach out to one another. We must embrace each other. And when we can't, we have to depend on what we have done in the past to be evidence that we are still caring and we are still allowing the Lord to work. And when that opportunity comes again, where we are together, we just have a better time all the more rejoicing because we are one in the spirit. We are one in Christ. What I'm trying to say clearly is this. The Apostle Paul has given us some good, solid, strong words. He's given us a lot of thoughts to look at. And we need to take those one by one and to pursue Christ. It's not enough to just have intellectual knowledge. We were talking about this in Sunday school today. Anne referred to this in her comments. It's so important for us to have the experience of Christ. It's Christ in us, for us, by us, with us. We are of him it is all about experience. We know so much about Christ and about the Bible intellectually. So many of us can talk about faith very easily. But the intellect is a big deceiver. Because if we have not taken what we know and applied it to our experience, then we are nothing. And this is the message I believe Paul is driving home. These last words that he writes in this letter. Experience Christ. Lift Jesus Christ up in your life. Yeah, you're going to have people reject you. People are going to stop their ears. Keep preaching. Preach the whole council. Press on. Remember, there is a reward for you. You are going to cross that finish line. Don't allow, allow any failure or any sin to keep you down. Confess it. Repent of it. Get back on track because that's what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. He freed you from the bondage of sin. You don't have to be there anymore. And yeah, we are going to be alone at times. We all are. Sometimes loneliness 
is very painful. But don't allow loneliness to deter you from walking with Christ. He is that brother that will never leave you. He is that God that will never forsake you. The final words of anyone are important. And certainly these words need to be listened to and we need to consider today how to apply them. Lord, I just thank you so much for your word and I thank you that you are a great and awesome God. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we're praying that our love will increase today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you are listening today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you don't have a relationship, you, you might know about him, but you don't know him, I would encourage you right now to just acknowledge your need for a Savior. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, for the wages of sin is death. We all need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ who willingly gave himself on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood to pay the penalty for your sin and for my sin. He can forgive you. He can cleanse you of your sin. And in doing so, give you eternal life. If you've never trusted him as Savior, would you do that right where you are? You can pray a simple prayer like this. Dear God, the Bible says I'm a sinner. I believe it. The Bible says Jesus died for me. I believe it. The Bible says Jesus rose from the dead. I believe it. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from my sin. Jesus, I ask that you would cleanse me. If you prayed that simple prayer and you meant it, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I would encourage you to, if you're here in this, in this room, to just let one of us know what you've done. We'll be happy to embrace you and just pray over you. If you don't have a Bible, we'll get you one. If you're listening on live stream, go to a, a believer. Go to someone that you know who is following Christ and tell them what you have done. And let them pray with you and help you. Get started in your Christian journey. If you're a believer here today, consider these words in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Maybe just one of the thoughts grabbed your attention. Allow the Spirit of God to take that and expand that in a way that you can be changed, that you can be transformed in your thinking and in your actions. To whom much is given, much will be required. Every time we place ourselves under the sound of the gospel, under the word of God, we have increased our accountability. We need to be so serious about pursuing him, about pressing on. Lord, help us all to do what we will be glad we did when we stand before you face to face. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for every church in our area proclaiming the truth of the gospel. We pray, Lord, that this area can experience a refreshing and a revival. Lord, we pray as believers we will stand together and that we will be true to your word and to each other. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I do want to let you know that I spoke with Daisy this morning. She said that she was sharing in their uh, church service. Uh, she did want me to tell you she has appreciated you praying for her and with her. Remember the words that Jeremiah wrote down, nothing is too hard for the Lord. God bless you.